gone to this computer. Okay, there we go. Now we're cooking. A couple more late people coming in. All right, so where we left off last time was the uh, more circle for strain transformation. So we did stress transformation, uh, the lecture two before that. And then last lecture, we dug into strain transformation and we left off with this uh, example for more circle. Does that uh, ring any bells for anybody? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, we only had a little bit left to go on lecture 24 and just a few little uh, pick up topics before we dive into uh, lecture 25, which is really meant for today's lecture. So uh, lecture 24, the end part of that was talking about some material property relationships. And let me get my annotate and my little glow sticky thing. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so as we learned very early in this course, a strain in the x direction due to a stress sigma x is equal to, uh, so epsilon prime x, epsilon prime x is equal to sigma x divided by Young's modulus e. So this is Hooke's law that we learned early in the semester. The only thing is I'm gonna put a little prime on here because what I'm gonna show you is how strains in different directions kind of add up in a three-dimensional problem when you consider uh, Poisson's effect as well. So if I have, uh, so this was strain in the x direction due to a stress in the x direction. What about a strain in the x direction due to a stress in the y direction? And that is equal to, and see how I'm doing the uh, apostrophe, double apostrophe. So epsilon double apostrophe x or double prime x is equal to, remember this Greek symbol here, this is nu, kind of looks like a bent V. Well, nu was Poisson's ratio. So the strain in the x direction due to a stress in the y, which is 90 degrees from the x, is equal to minus nu times sigma y over epsilon, um, Young's modulus e. So we learned this from Hooke's law. We learned this from the section on Poisson's ratio. Strain in the x direction due to a stress in the z direction is likewise epsilon triple prime equal to negative nu sigma z over e. So these are three components of strain from three different directions of stress. Adding all three components together, we have that the strain in the x direction and Young's modulus is common to all three, so we can pull that out front. So epsilon x is equal to one over e, sigma x minus nu times sigma y plus sigma z. Similarly, uh, let me pull some of this stuff over here so I can see. Okay, so similarly, we can do the same thing in the y direction and in the z direction. What is just, as you can see, what's interchanging is the sigma x becomes sigma y, sigma y becomes sigma z. But here you can get the strain in any one direction if you know the stress in the other, well, in all three of the other directions. For, or, do you have any questions? Any questions on this part? Okay, uh, for shear stress to shear strain, gamma xy is the shear strain. Gamma xy is equal to tau xy over g. So we learned this early on in the uh, strain section of the course. And uh, gamma yz is tau yz over g. 
gamma xz is tau xz over g. So these are the three primary directions. So we can relate, uh, well actually, so this, this is a complete section. So epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z, these are your normal stress strains. Gamma xy, gamma yz, gamma xz, these are your shear strains. And we can relate the shear modulus to the modulus of elasticity by saying that g, the shear modulus is equal to e over two times one plus nu. This is the relationship between Young's modulus and the modulus of uh, rigidity or the shear modulus. Okay, so any questions about these basic principles? Professor? Yes. For the Poisson's ratio, is it when we solve it, it's a negative value? For Poisson's ratio? Yeah. No, so, no, no. No, Poisson's ratio is a positive value between 0 and 0 0.5. OK. But Poisson's ratio is always multiplied as a negative against a strain to get the other strain. Right. Oh, okay. Remember? Yeah, because so, I, was, I was looking at the old formulas that we have. Uh huh. And I think I have a negative E lateral and over E longitudinal. So that's why I asked why is it negative over here? Oh, 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 oh. Well, okay. That's because E radial or E lateral, one or the other is going to be negative. So those two negatives cancel. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, now I, okay, now I know what you're asking. So nu is always positive, but the equation was negative ER over EL. Yeah. And that's because either ER or EL will always be negative because one of them is gonna be the opposite of the other. Oh, uh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. All right, so here we have an example. Here we have this uh, two inch by two inch uh, square material. Uh, actually, I kind of drew it to scale, huh? So this little square of some material is a quarter inch thick and it's two inches by two inches square. The material is being subjected to a 500 pounds per inch tensile force in the horizontal. 350 pounds per inch tensile force in the vertical direction. So sigma x is 500 pounds per inch. Sigma y, actually, sorry, got to divide that by a quarter inch. The load in the x direction is 500 pounds per inch. The load in the y direction is 350 pounds per inch. Both of them are pulling the material in tension. The Young's modulus for this material is unbelievably high, 597,000. Actually, that's not too high, is it? That's PSI. I was thinking KSI. Eh, never mind. OK, so it's not that impressive. So this is some kind of a carbon fiber or something. Um, but yeah, at first glance, I thought that was KSI. And then I was going to be amazed, but it's not as PSI. News uh, or Poisson's ratio for this material is 0.25. And so with the given loading and the given material properties, the question for this is under this degree of loading, what are the new dimensions? And I'm looking for all three dimensions. I want the new A dimension, the new B dimension, and the new thickness of the material dimension. All three of those can be determined from this loading. Any questions about the, the problem? Um, since they're an intention, does yes. that mean that T will go, the thickness will be lower? It does. Okay. But, you, but you don't know that right off the bat because you could have one direction in tension 
and you could have the other direction in compression and which one is going to win you you don't know until you you go through the equation but it is safe to say that if both directions are in tension then t is going to be reduced it's going to be it's almost like uh think of a square of silly putty and you pull that silly putty out and it's going to get uh it's going to the thickness will be reduced right okay okay so sigma x is equal to the force per inch divided by the thickness of a quarter inch. That gives me 2,000 PSI. So that's my uh, tensile sigma x. Uh, sigma y, similarly, is 350 pounds per inch over a quarter inch, gives me 1,400 PSI. And sigma z is zero PSI. What would sigma z be? What, what would that represent? Can you repeat that question? Sigma Z, if there was a value for Sigma Z, what would that value represent? So what I'm looking for is Sigma Z would be some stress that's either pulling this in or out of the page. Sigma Z would be in the in or out of the page direction. Into the page. Or, yes. So in this case, there is no loading going in or out of the page. So sigma z is equal to zero. So to find sigma, uh, sigma z, if there were uh -huh. some load, yeah. would we just use the same equation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so say like I, I told you that there's a force that's trying to pull in and or out of the page, just say out of the page. There's a force trying to pull this thing apart out of the page. Uh, 2,000 pounds. So then what you would do is sigma z would then be 2,000 pounds divided by two inches by two inches. So 2,000 divided by four, that would be 500 PSI. Okay, so now we can use our equations to find the strain in the x direction. Epsilon X is equal to one over E Sigma X minus nu times Sigma Y plus Sigma Z. So I can just plug in the values. I can take 597 PSI in for E. Sigma X is 2000, nu is 0.25, 1400. Sigma Z is equal to zero. And this equals, remember this is a strain. So this is 0 0.00276 inch per inch. Um, please remember, we only have uh, one more homework assignment, and then we have our final. I am really hoping by now, most of you have caught on to the units. Units in this class are very important, and I, I'm going to be looking very closely that any measure of strain is measured in inch per inch. Any measure of stress is going to be PSI, KSI, megapascal, something like that. So just, just a side note, please be very cognizant of your units. Sigma y is very similar to sigma x. You just substitute the y for the x and the x for the y. And I plug in my values, 1400, 2000 plus zero. I get a strain in the y direction of 0, 0, 00151 inch per inch. And here's the interesting one is sigma z or epsilon z, epsilon z is equal to one over e sigma z, which is zero minus nu times sigma x plus sigma y. So if I plug in the values, sigma z is zero, but you have nu times 2000 plus 1400 PSI. So I do have a negative strain in the zero uh, epsilon y direction. Uh, 00142. And the negative strain means that the material is shortening. It's, uh, it's not really compressing because there's nothing pushing it down, but it's not elongating, it is shortening. So what are the final dimensions? Final dimension is the original dimension plus the strain times the original dimension. 
So I have two inches plus 00276 inch per inch times two gives me 2.00553 inches. That is the stretched out length of A under this loading. B. Um, said, Professor, wait, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, um, yeah. For A, wouldn't we add 00151 because that's in the Y direction? Uh-oh. I have those backwards. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, either way it works because they're both two, but yeah, just the symbols are off. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the symbols are off. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, let me make a note of this so that this doesn't go on into the next time. This is lecture 24. I am on, uh, well, tell me what slide I'm on. So, a prime really should be two plus 0 0.00151 times two. B prime, two plus 0 0.00276 times two. You know, and I think about it, that totally makes sense because the 500 is obviously stretching it more than the 350. So B should be bigger than A. Uh, good observation. All right. so. Uh, don't look at this. A prime is 2.0302. Uh, B prime is 2.00553 inches. But I think most interestingly, the new thickness T is a quarter inch minus 0 0.00142 inch per inch times a quarter inch. So in the thickness direction, we are now 0 0.24965 inches. And that is entirely due to Poisson's effect. Uh, any questions? I have some, Professor. In like the real world, do you just like ignore that one because it's so small? Uh, depends. Depends on it. Totally depends on what you're doing. I can give you uh, a couple of examples, like in the real world. And, and, and I know that this class, we have a lot of different aspiring engineers. I know we have people from all kinds of different fields, but my field is structural engineering. So that's where my experience is. And in the world of structural engineering, if this was like say a steel plate and I'm calculating things about the properties of a steel plate, uh, for most applications in structural engineering, you betcha. I would totally ignore it. Uh, I, I would not be concerned about uh, 10 thousandths of an inch stretch on a steel plate. So in my normal everyday activities, I probably wouldn't even be making these calculations. I would just check that 500 creates a stress of 2000 PSI. It's a steel plate that won't even yield until 50,000 PSI, it's fine. So that's, that's one answer. But the other answer is in my field, in my expertise of structural engineering, we use software that uses finite element theory. And finite element theory is basically taking a material, you assign it uh, material properties like these, and you create uh, a shape out of elements. And so you could be creating uh, anything, there, it's endless. You could be creating a cylinder, uh, pylons, I-beams, uh, you name it. You can, if you can define it, you can build it out of finite elements. But the whole point of finite element is that you have to take the macro structure that you have built and you have to subdivide it into micro elements. So two inch by two inch is a perfectly acceptable grid spacing. If I'm modeling a beam or a diaphragm or a shear wall, anything like that. And getting to the point, the finite element, uh, in order for it to give you accurate results, when you apply macro loads to, you know, like if I'm designing a shear wall, I'll be applying loads in the order of 1,000 to 2,000 kips. 
uh, on you know a million to two million pounds on a uh, thirty foot long by two foot thick concrete share wall, right? Mm -hmm. So if I subdivide it into these little elements, the people who write the software absolutely have to get all of this stuff right here. They have to get that perfectly right, or it will not work. It's just by, to be precise. It has to be absolutely precise. Or by the time you start at one corner and you get to the other end of the shear wall in the analysis, it'll be complete garbage if you don't have all of this absolutely nailed down. Cool. OK, thank you. OK. Any other questions? This is the end of lecture 24. Any other questions on lecture 24? Um, just a quick question. So when we do um, t prime, why do we multiply epsilon z by 0.25? Because the uh, basically the equation for the deformed length of something is equal to uh, the strain times the original length, that's the deformation, plus the original length. So each one of these is following that. You have epsilon is the strain times L naught plus L naught, okay? If you, if you go back and look at how we define strain from the very first class, we said epsilon strain is equal to L minus L naught over L naught. So if you solve for L, L's the new uh, length, L naught is the original length. So if epsilon equals L minus L naught over L naught, then solve for L. And L, which is A prime, B prime, T prime, L is equal to L naught plus epsilon times L naught. So that's what I did each time. I just kind of reversed it right here, but this is epsilon times L naught plus L naught. Okay, thank you. Did that make sense? Yes, it did. Okay. Any other questions on lecture 24? All right. So let us find lecture 25. Okay, so uh, today's lecture, and again, I don't think we're gonna get all the way through it, but we'll, we'll see how far we can get. Today's lecture is about beam deflection. And there are actually a number of ways to calculate the deflection of flexural members, uh, otherwise known as beams. There's a number of ways to do it. There's an energy method, uh, the one we're going to learn today is called the double integral method. Uh, there's also uh, the stiffness matrix method. There's a flexibility method. There's several different ways to do this. Uh, but what we're going to learn today is uh, commonly known as the double integral method of uh, solving for beam deflection. So before we go into the math of determining beam deflection, I want to have a, just a quick talk about how much it helps to sketch what the deflected shape should look like beforehand. And this can be very helpful. Uh, so the first step in these types of problems, the very first step is to draw the moment diagram. Okay, so we learned from chapter eight how to derive the equations for moments on the beam. And we also learned how to draw the moment diagram either from the equations or from uh, the graphical method. Okay, so here's some guidelines to sketching a beam deflected shape. Uh, chapter eight, I believe, no, chapter six. I'm sorry, chapter six. Is this chapter six? The, oh, what I'm talking about now? The deflection of beams. Oh, yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know. Uh, hang on a sec. Or do we talk about this? 
The syllabus says it's chapter 10.5. Okay, thank you. Uh, 10.5? No. Syllabus is wrong. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, no, it is chapter 12. And we are 12.2, slope and displacement by integration. So that, we skip chapter 11, right? Do we skip chapter 11? Basis for beam design, prismatic beam design. Uh, yeah, I think we did. Okay. Uh, basis for beam design. Designs of beams and shafts. Yeah. Yeah, we did. You know why we did? Because all the important things that we did, we did in chapter six and seven and eight. Six was shear and moment diagrams. Seven was uh, horizontal shear, shearing stresses. Eight was combined loading. Um, so what this is doing, chapter 11, is just kind of combining the ways that we have to find the stress and comparing it to material allowables. And I leave that out because that's really more for your classes in steel design, concrete design, wood design, those sort of things. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, so back to chapter 12. All right, so the guidelines to sketching. So a positive moment, remember how many times I've said there is a very different, big difference, definite difference between a positive moment and a, a negative moment. You know, when we're talking about internal moments, a positive moment is a very different thing than a negative moment. A positive moment is gonna cause a concave up or a smiley shape. A negative moment is the opposite, a concave down or a frowny shape. Where you have a pin support, there is no vertical movement, but the beam may have a slope to it. And where you have a fixed support, there is no vertical movement and there is no slope. So I have some illustrations kind of illustrate these points, but these are the main points. A positive moment produces a smiley shape Negative moment produces a frowny shape where you have a pin support. You can still have beam slope, but no vertical movement. At fixed support, you have no movement whatsoever. Okay, so here's a beam. Under a uniform load, you're going to get a positive moment. A simply supported uniform loaded beam produces a positive moment, and a positive moment produces a smiley shape. The beam is going to deflect downwards. Positive moment, smiley. Okay, now if I have a beam where I'm actually pulling up on the beam, then that produces a negative moment. Negative moment produces a frowny shape. Negative moment, that's a frowny shape. If I have a cantilever, cantilevers, if you're pushing down on it, produce a negative moment and the negative moment is going to produce, again, the frowny shape. So there's my negative moment due to the cantilever and the fixed support. And I'm calling this a half frowny shape. You notice that the slope here is flat. There is no slope at the fixed support. But over here, I have a slope uh, where I do not have a fixed support. So wherever you have a fixed support, it fixes both the deflection and the slope. There's no slope there. Uh, going back a second, a pin support here, I, I have no vertical movement, but I do have some slope at my pin support. Okay, and probably the more complicated one is the propped cantilever beam. This type of beam with a uniform load has both positive and negative moments in the same beam. Positive moment is over on this side and that produces a smiley shape. But then we got some negative moment from the cantilever and the smiley turns into a frowny. 
So these are just some guidelines on how to sketch a beam's deflection. Sketching a beam's deflection is uh, really important to understanding your boundary conditions and getting the integrals correct. Okay, so now here comes the theoretical part. A lot of this, by the way, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because a lot of this I literally copied and pasted out of the lecture where we derive the flexural formula where stress is equal to my over i. This is the same concept. So we talked about, remember we had a beam that was before bending and a beam section in the bent shape. We have a neutral axis at the center of gravity. And when there is no load, then delta x at the center is equal to delta s at the top. Uh, there's no difference in the uh, length of these sections under no load. But when you apply load, then delta x along the neutral axis remains the same length because at the neutral axis, there is no stress, there is no strain. So delta x remains unchanged, but delta s is going to shorten because this is the compressive side. So delta s will shorten to a delta prime s. Delta prime S is going to be less than delta X. So the strain, as we were just noting, the strain is equal to the new length minus the original length over the original length. The new length is delta S prime minus delta S over delta S. And that's the strain here at the top of the beam. The strain at the neutral axis again is zero. So the strain is also equal to delta S prime minus delta X over delta X because delta X and delta S were the same length at the beginning. And so remember this, we, if we take a perpendicular from the neutral axis and we take another perpendicular from the neutral axis that's bent over here, those two come together at a point. That point has a radius of rho and it has a angle between these two perpendiculars of theta. So delta x down here, if you think of this as a triangle, delta x is equal to rho times delta theta. We're using that small angle deal there. And delta s prime is equal to rho minus y times delta theta. Right, so if this is delta x and this is rho, then this is delta s prime and this is rho minus y. That gets me here. Based on small angle sine function of theta and y is the distance from the neutral axis to the point of interest, which we're taking to be the top of the beam at this point. And so what I'm done here is here, I have substituted for delta S prime, rho minus y delta theta, and for delta X, rho times delta theta. So I substitute those into here. So my strain at the top of the beam is rho minus y delta theta minus rho delta theta over rho delta theta, which simplifies to minus y over rho. Everything else drops out. So what this is saying is that the strain at the uh, top of the beam is proportional to the distance from the neutral axis to the top of the beam and divided by rho, which is a measure of the curvature. And so we can say that uh, the strain is equal to, or the strain at any point is equal to minus y over c times the maximum strain. So this is this basically is just saying that by similar triangles, if the maximum strain is at the furthest extent at a distance C, then the strain anywhere else can be found by the proportions. Okay, and this is a stress diagram. You remember this when we did this last time. And this is Hooke's law. 
since uh, sigma is equal to e times epsilon, then I can rearrange this and I have uh, epsilon is equal to this. And so I can, let's see, what did I do here? Oh, divided or multiply everything by e. So basically it is kind of a trivial solution, but uh, sigma is equal to, again, the proportion of y to c. Really, this is just asserting that the stress is proportional based on the distance from the neutral axis. Stress is equal to Young's modulus times y over rho, substituting in for c. And then we found that the location of the neutral axis, uh, if you integrate the area, then all the forces have to equal zero. So the forces are equal to the stress times the area. So if you integrate all the stresses over the whole area, that's equal to zero. And the stress is equal to here, minus y over c stress max, which is here. And I can pull the constants out front. And since us, uh, sigma max over C does not equal zero, otherwise there's no load and the whole thing's trivial, then that means that uh, the integral of A from Y dA has to equal zero. So that means the first moment of the section has to equal zero. Thus the neutral axis has to be located at the centroidal axis for the cross section. That's basically what this is saying. It's saying that all of this has to equal all of this, and that's only true if it's equal to zero right at the neutral axis. Summing all the stresses about the neutral axis, you have the moment is equal to the integral of a y df, which is a y uh, sigma dA, which is a y substituting in for sigma again, y c theta max dA, theta max c goes out front, and you have uh, integral of a y squared dA, which is the moment of inertia. So we can substitute in the moment of inertia. So the moment is equal to the maximum stress over C times I. Therefore, your maximum stress is equal to MC over I. Stress is equal to minus MY over I. Okay, so that was like a, what, a five minute review of the flexural formula. Uh, again, all of this uh, is in, oh gosh, I don't remember which lecture it was, but we covered this at length in that lecture. This is a complete refreshment of that because now we're going to take it to the next step. <clears throat> so starting with our result that sigma is equal to MSY minus MY over I, and from Hooke's law, strain is equal to stress over Young's modulus, which is equal to M minus MY over EI, okay? So strain is equal to minus MY over EI. Strain is also equal to minus Y over rho. One over rho is equal to minus E over Y, just kind of rearranging the variables. And then I can substitute that back. So then let's see, minus E over Y equals MY over EI, that was minus uh, epsilon, is MY over EI over Y. And so the Y's drop out. And what we have is one over rho is equal to M over EI. And this is what's known as curvature. So one over rho or M over EI is what we call curvature. Curvature is a measure of curvature. How much is the beam bending is curvature. So you can see here that the more moment is applied, the greater the curvature. The larger the stiffness of the beam, the less curvature. So this is an important uh, finding of the equations is that curvature is equal to the moment over EI. Okay, 
So then if we define the beam deflection as V, V as a function of position of span X, then, okay, so here's a beam that's deflecting clearly. So at some arbitrary location X, the deflection from the unloaded shape is known as V. V would be a function of X. Does that make sense? Do I have any questions so far? Can you repeat that one more time again? Sure, I'm just setting up uh, the variables. I haven't really solved for anything just yet, but I'm just setting up the variables. So if I measure X from one end, this is an arbitrary X, then whatever the deflection is at that point X, that's been labeled as V. So V is a function of X. If X is equal to zero, in this case, V is equal to zero. If X is equal to L over two, then V is equal to its maximum. Okay, so I'm just establishing that we're measuring the deflection V as a function of X. Okay, so we can write it as V is a function of X. From calculus, we get the solution to, uh, let's see, what did we do here? We did uh, one over rho is equal to D squared V over DX squared over one plus dv over dx squared all to the three halves. This is a solution to this equation up here, one over rho. And I would, honestly, I would have to really kind of go back and dig into the calculus to see how they got this solution. I didn't feel that was super important. I think we can all just look at this and go, hmm, okay, sure. I remember that, uh-huh, looks good to me. So, uh, if anybody really wanted me to, I could try to find a go back and see exactly what the math was to go from here to here. But for now, suffice it to say that this is the solution to V is the function of X. So if I substitute back in, then I have this whole mess here is equal to M over EI. And remember V is the deformation of the beam at some location x. So that's what we want. We want a, an equation that will tell us what the deflection v is at some given x. That's the whole point of this uh, procedure. OK, well, dv dx is the slope. That's how much the uh, deflection changes over a change in length. That's the slope. And the slope for typical structural beams is very small, very close to zero. So if I approximate this term as zero, then this whole thing reduces to just dv squared over dx squared equals m over ei. I'll give you, um, what do we do in the real world in all practicality? In the real world, uh, almost all of your software will derive deflections based on this expression. Uh, they don't tell you that, but that's the math that's built into the finite element is that deflections are based on this. Some of your more sophisticated software, some of your uh, more expensive software will have a setting that you can click on that is called large displacement or large curvature. And what that does is when you click on that, it then runs through all the math without ignoring this. And you can see what the difference is. And generally speaking, the difference is absolutely negligible for beams in the real world. Uh, when I say beams in the real world, I'm talking about like a steel beam spanning 30 feet and under all of the loading that's uh, imposed on a regular steel beam spanning 30 feet, you could expect deflections on the order of a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, something like that. So three eighths of an inch over a beam spanning 30 feet 
the slope on that is exceedingly small. And this is for all intents and purposes identical to this solution. The only time this would really come into play would be like a 30 foot long beam made out of rubber. And under its uh, applied loading, the beam is deflecting three or four feet maybe then maybe this would kick in and actually start meaning something. Okay, so does that make sense? How much are the softwares? Well, they're, they're getting more and more expensive. Uh, say $1,800 to five or six or $7,000. And then the really high order ones that uh, would not be purchased by companies like mine or being used in offices like mine, but would be purchased by uh, universities and research facilities. Those can go 30, 50, $60,000 for a software package. Yeah, and then you gotta renew it every year. <laughs> That's the part that uh, drives me crazy. It's like pay $7,000 for a software program. And then what? I got to renew the license? Yeah, that's like every other year. All right. So uh, I have this result. Now what I can do is rearrange my variables. So I can say that my moment as a function of x is equal to ei, which is the stiffness times dv squared over dx squared. So this is where the double integral method for beam deflection comes from. Notice that this is the second differential. So I have to integrate twice to get v. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for v. So in order to get v from dv squared, I have to integrate this twice. So differentiating. Just coming up with some other uh, practicalities of this. If I take the differential of this, ei dv cubed over dx cubed is the shear as a function of x, and e d to the fourth v dx to the fourth is w, which is the loading. So remember a while back, I said that the moment is the integral of the shear, the shear is the integral of the load. And that's, this is uh, just reinforcing those concepts uh, with the math behind it. Okay, so here's uh, our first example. What we would like to do is here's a simple span beam. Uh, the beam is of length L. I'm applying a load P at L over two. Now here's the neat thing about this uh, procedure, the double uh, integral procedure. Kind of the cool thing about it is I don't need to know what L is or L over two is or what P is. I can solve the whole thing in general terms and then apply it to any beam with any P and get valid results. So that's kind of the neat part about this uh, procedure. Okay, so what do we do? We got to solve this beam and we have to find the moment as a function of X. So we're very well practiced in that from chapter six. First thing we do is uh, do a free body diagram, find our reactions. Only this time, and I wanna make sure everybody's clear about this. When P is given in so many kips or kilonewtons, then you solve your reaction for kips or kilonewtons. But if P is not given to you, if P is just a variable P, then you solve for your reactions in terms of P. That's all the information you have. So uh, solving for RBY, summing moments about A, RBY is P over two, which makes sense because it's symmetrical. Our AY is also P over two. How many cut points do I need to describe this thing? Oops. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear somebody. Two cuts. Two cuts, that's right. One, I didn't do the second one, but uh, one and two. So free body diagram for cut number one. 
My end reaction is P over two. There is no load on this section. Here's positive shear, positive moment. And I solve for my shear. Shear is equal to P over two. I solve for the moment. The moment is P over two times X. And this is valid between X is equal to zero and L over two. Okay, I went through that very fast because we've covered this extensively in chapter six. Uh, is everybody okay with that? Anybody not okay with that? All right, nobody is not okay with that. Double negative, get everybody confused. All right, well, the point of this is that in order to solve for the deflection, I need to know what the moment is as a function of X. That's the, uh, the point right here. You can graph the shear and moment, it will be easier. Yeah, but in this case, the graph doesn't help us. I need the equation. Okay, I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Uh, Mustafa is right. We could graph the shear and moment diagram a lot quicker and a lot easier than doing this. But the shear and moment diagrams will not get me the deflection that I need. I need the equation for the moment as a function of X in order to find the deflection as a function of X. Okay, so. DV dx EI is equal to the integral of the moment of X. Uh, and remember the equation is DV squared dx squared EI is equal to the moment a function of X. So integrating both sides, I have DV dx, not DV squared dx squared. And I have the integral of MX. So the integral of M sub X is the integral of px over two, which is equal to px squared over four, plus we have a constant of integration. Remember these guys? Every time you integrate, you get a constant. Okay, so that was just the first integration. Now, what I'm looking for is V, not DV, I'm looking for V. V is the deflection. So in order to get V, I have to integrate both sides again. So now VEI is equal to the integral of this result, PX squared over four plus C1. And that gives me PX cubed over 12 plus C1X plus C2. Every time you integrate, you get another constant of integration. So how do I solve C1 and C2? The Anybody? Position of X from zero to L over two. Yes, we have to take advantage of our boundary conditions. The boundary conditions. So the first equation here, dv dx is equal to the slope. That's what dv dx is. That's the slope of the beam. Do we know for certain the slope of that beam at any given x? Is there an x somewhere that we know what the slope is? At uh, zero, v is zero as well. I mean the slope. Actually, what you said first is correct. Wait, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So that's the other boundary condition. I was gonna get to that in a second, but you're right. At X equal to zero and X equal to L, both ends of the beam, then V is equal to zero. That is true, but we're not gonna use that just yet. Is there anywhere on the beam that we know what the slope of the beam is? How about at the midspan of the beam? What is the slope at the midspan of a beam 
that is loaded right at the mid span of the beam. Doesn't it take on a deflected shape that looks like this? The slope should be zero. So at the mid span of the beam, the slope is equal to zero. That's right. So uh, remember how we started this lecture, sketching out the deflected shape of the beams can really help you identify these conditions. But that is the trick. The trick is at x equal to L over two, the mid span in the beam, dv dx is equal to zero. Okay, so we're gonna say dv dx is equal to zero at x equal to L over two. We have zero slope at the mid span, but that is only due to the symmetry of the problem. If the load was at one side or the other side, then that would not apply and we, we'd have a more difficult uh, time trying to figure this out. But this one is symmetrically loaded, so this is true. So with this being true, then I can say that this result here is equal to zero. The slope is equal to zero if I plug in L over two for X. So now this is a, a constant, and this is my only variable. So I can solve for C1, and C1 is equal to minus P L squared over 16. That's just solving this right here. Now that I have C1, the second equation, I now only have one unknown. So I can solve for one unknown with one equation. So the second equation, now, as uh, somebody said a moment ago, we know that at X equal to zero and at X equal to L, by the way, then the deflection is equal to zero. So we can plug that in. Uh, well, actually what I did first is I put in C1 here. I plug that into here because now we know what C1 is. So uh, VEI is equal to PX cubed over 12 minus PL squared over 16X plus C2. Now I can solve for C2. V, the deflection is equal to zero at X equal to zero. So I can plug in zero and x equal to zero, x equal to zero, solve for C2, C2 is equal to zero. Therefore, my final equation, V times EI is equal to PX cubed over 12 plus minus PL squared over 16X. So what this is, is if I know my section properties and my material properties, I know I, I know E, and for any given x, I can now tell you what the deflection is, right? So we now have the deflection as a function of x. And this is very powerful. You can find the deflection anywhere on that span. The final solution, I just took the EI and brought it over here. So the deflection is 1 over EI, PX cubed over 12, minus PL squared over 16x. General equation for the deflection valid anywhere on the span. What about maximum deflection? How do we find maximum deflection? Well, we take our general equation that we just solved for and we plug in L over two. We know the maximum deflection is gonna be at the maximum moment where the slope is equal to zero. So we can just plug in, do the symmetry, we know it's gonna be at L over two. So we plug in L over two for each X and our final result, maximum deflection is minus PL cubed over 48 EI. So a lot of you know that you can look up, uh, you can look up beam deflections in tables. There's all kinds of tables, and a lot of your design books will have tables in them, the steel design book, concrete design book, so on and so forth. Or you can look on the web and find them. So for this situation, this is, this is what you're gonna see in the table. It's gonna be in a very general form. You can plug in the length, you can plug in the load, 
and the beam material and section properties and get the deflection. So there's whole tables with numbers like this. Here's where the numbers are coming from. This is how you can derive the numbers yourself. Any questions on example one? So professor, just for clarification, the slope at x is equals to zero and x is equals to L is the highest and at the middle is zero. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then the curvature when x is equals to zero is zero, but in the middle, it's the highest. Well, not the, the curvature, the deflection. Oh, I mean the, the deflection. Yeah, the, the curvature is highest at the highest moment, but the deflection in this case is, but the deflection is not always the highest at the point of the highest moment. That, that's not always true, especially for unsymmetrical loading. Yeah, so but just, in this case, it'll in this be case, high in the middle. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I was going to say is, um, okay, so dv dx is here. Uh, where did I dv dx? You know, I don't think I did that, but what you can do is right here. See where dv dx ei is px squared over four minus pl squared over 16. So what you can do is solve for your slope at any point on x. So if you plug in x equal to zero, your slope is minus PL squared over 16. And if you plug in uh, X equal to L, I'm pretty sure you're gonna get a positive PL squared over 16. And if you plug in X equal to L over two, you're gonna get a slope of exactly zero. So from this equation here, we didn't really formalize it like I did down here, but if you're interested in the slope as a function of x, you would just solve it right here and just plug C1 into this equation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oops. Okay, so this is my maximum deflection and this is showing maximum deflection at L over two. This is the deflected shape. Okay, uh, example number two. And before we start, were there any other questions on example one? Okay. Example number two is a simply supported beam with a uniform load of magnitude W. Uh, the beam is L long, the load is W in magnitude. Find the uh, deflection as a function of x and find the maximum deflection. So we uh, do our free body diagram. I find the resultant of the load to find my reactions. Find my reactions. Uh, again, this is somewhat trivial at this point, but the reaction at B is WL over two. Reaction at A, WL over two. I need one cut point. We're not looking at this, we're looking at this. So just one cut point is uh, sufficient for the whole span. I do my one cut point. I do my free body diagram. I have a re end reaction at WL over two. And I find the equation for the shear and the equation for the moment. So my equation for the moment is minus WX squared over two plus WX over two. And this is valid between x equals zero and L. Okay, so again, went through that fairly quickly, but uh, should be old hat at this point for you guys. So moving on, now I have the equation for M, the moment as a function of x right here. So, uh, dv dx ei is equal to the integral of the moment as a function of x. So the integral of this minus wx squared over two plus wl over two, which gives me minus wx cubed over six plus wx squared over four 
plus my constant of integration. I integrate everything again. Now I have uh, integral dv dx is v. Vei is the integral of our solution here, which gives me minus wx to the fourth over 24 plus wx lx cubed over 12 c1x plus c2. Now we need some boundary conditions. Do we know anything about the slope with respect to the span? Anybody? What if I draw a sketch of the deflected shape? The beam is symmetrical. So do we know anything about the slope anywhere on that span? At the half point equal to zero? Bingo, thank you. At L over two, it's really surprisingly difficult to draw this, right? But at L over two, right there, the slope is equal to zero. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna say. The slope is equal to zero at x equals L over two. So then what I do is I go to this equation, I plug in zero for my slope, EI disappears with the zero, and I plug in L over two for the x cubed and x squared here, here, and I solve for, or I simplify, then I solve for C1. C1 is minus WL to the third over 24. That's just solving this equation here equal to zero. Okay, now uh, I took that result for C1 and I plugged it back in to my equation for deflection, VEI is equal to, and I plugged in for the unknown C1. So now I have minus WX to the fourth over 24 plus WLX cubed over 12 minus WL to the third X over 24 plus C2. Now we need to solve for C2. Well, again, we know the deflection is equal zero at the pin support at zero. So I set the whole equation equal to zero and I plug in X equal to zero and C2 again is equal to zero. Therefore, my whole equation for deflection is minus wx to the fourth over 24, wlx to the third over 12, minus wl to the third x 20 over 24. And just divide by ei, this is our final result. A little messy, yes, but not that difficult. If you know the span l and you know the load w, you know the section properties EI, then for any desired X between zero and L, you can get that deflection directly from this equation. General equation for deflection valid anywhere on the span. Now, due to symmetry, maximum deflection on this beam will occur at the mid span X equal to L over two. So my maximum deflection is found by plugging in everywhere you have an X, I plug in L over two. And that gives me kind of simplifying each one of these terms. And then I can further simplify down to minus five WL to the fourth over 384 EI. This is like uh, bread and butter structural engineering. Anybody, knows uh, or any structural engineer should know just from memory that the deflection of a beam due to the uniform load on the simply supported beam is minus five WL to the fourth over 384 EI. But this is where it comes from. This is the whole derivation to this value that you could look up in a table. Any questions? I have a question, Professor. So I just realized that the 
uh, when the slope is zero, it's the inflection point where the shear at, right? Yes, uh, where the slope is equal to zero is where the shear is equal to zero and the moment is at it's, its the maximum, is at its highest, yes. But I do wanna caution you that if you have a beam with the load that's offset to one side, uh, uh -huh. I, I know we're running low on time here, but if I have a beam and I have a point load off to one side here like this, then the moment diagram, the moment diagram does look like this, but the maximum deflection will not occur at that same location. The deflection, the deflected shape is going to look something like this. It is skewed, but it's not maximum where the moment is maximum. Oh, it's not necessarily the slope over there is going to be zero. That's right. Okay. That's right. So this takes a little bit more advanced technique to solve for this guy. I just want to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, thinking that's a generalization. Yeah. I, I, one more question. So this, all the examples that we're doing is symmetrical. So if it's not symmetrical, do we need to do double integral in each cut point? Like the each section that we cut, do we need to find, do like double integrate all of that? You can, yes. If you have different moments at different points, then you do the double integral and you integrate from zero to L1 and then from L1 to L2, yes, you have to piece it together like that. Oh, okay, thank yep. you. Welcome. All right, everybody. Uh, Next week, we're going to meet on Tuesday. We're going to finish this lecture. We're more than halfway through. We're about three quarters of the way through this lecture. And then we're going to pick up the scheduled lecture for next Tuesday. Thursday, obviously, no class. Uh, happy Turkey Day for everybody. And then the following week, we have a meeting on Tuesday and Thursday. And that's it for this class. And then after that, we just have the final. Okay, so uh, I bid everybody a good night. Have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes, thank you, everybody.